Andy, go ahead and start. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me? Um, so I'm here today to talk about uh, the aphids that were trapped and uh, collected from Washington blueberries as part of a big project that uh, Chris Benedict and several other people are doing there in Whatcom and Skagit County. And although on the program, I was listed as uh, with the Northwest Potato Research Consortium. That's my day job. Um, today I'm here talking to you as, a, as an entomologist and about my favorite topic, which is aphids. So my, in my private life, I'm a hobbyist uh, entomologist and work on aphids, describing new species and collecting aphids all over the country, everywhere I go. And I have a, a website, aphid trek, Dot org that I have for, for fun, basically um, discussing some of the aphid research that I do. So that's some of my background. I've been working on aphids as an entomologist for almost 30 years, starting when I was an undergraduate in the late 80s, and um, have a fair bit of work uh, done over the years on virus transmission um, as, as it relates to aphids as well. So. Um, before going farther into blueberries, I might as well cover aphids in general. Um, so a few aphid facts. I'm gonna throw some terms at you here just for fun and then explain what they mean. Um, modern aphids are all parthenogenetic and viviparous. And parthenogenetic means that the females give birth to live young, I mean, give birth to copies of themselves. Basically, they can clone themselves. So anytime you see an aphid on a leaf and it's got babies all around it, those babies are copies of herself. And that, that's what parthenogenetic means. They're also viviparous. And viviparous means that they give birth to live young as opposed to laying eggs. They have, uh, aphids also have telescoping generations. And uh, this is p potentially the coolest thing about aphids. They are um, born pregnant. And that's what telescoping generations means. So you know, when you see a baby aphid that's just been born out of its mother, it is already developing babies. Um, in its ovaries that it will be able to start depositing as soon as it becomes an adult. So there's two or three generations uh, within each aphid that you see out there in the field. Um, so that's one reason they can reproduce so quickly and develop big populations. Um, they also have, aphids have seasonal polymorphism and that, what that means is that the aphids early in the spring are gonna look different than the aphids in the middle of summer within a given species and, and then in the fall as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute with another slide. Um, most aphids reproduce uh, parthenogenetically, meaning they make clones of themselves uh, all year, except in the fall where there's one period of sexual reproduction where there's uh, female, specialized females that can lay eggs and males to mate with them. So a few kinds of aphids never produce any sexual cycle or eggs at all. Uh, most aphids feed on plant phloem, which is the sugary sap. Uh, some aphids feed on plants that don't have phloem, so obviously they don't feed on phloem in those cases, but in the case of aphids that we'd be concerned about, they're all feeding on the phloem, the sugary sap. Most aphids are host specific, and this is super important. I'm gonna talk about it a lot later on. Um, almost all aphids are specific in terms of their ability to, to feed and develop to one species of plant or one genus of plants, um, sometimes a few related genera of plants. So in the case of blueberries, the vaccinium is the genus of plants and there's a small handful of aphids all over the world that specialize on vaccinium and can't feed on anything else. And almost all the aphids you see in the field um, that are not feeding on blueberries are not feeding on blueberries because they can't, they can't reproduce on it. Um, some aphids host alternate and others don't. In the case of blueberry aphids, uh, the species that feed on blueberry are, are just staying on blueberries all, all year long and don't host alternate to other crops or plants. Um, there are about 5,000 species of aphids in the world, um, somewhere around 1,000 in the Western US and Canada. 
And I bet in Western Washington, there's at least 200 species of aphids. So there's a lot out there, uh, a lot flying around doing their, their thing. So this is the aphid life cycle, and this is the seasonal polymorphism. In the spring, aphids start off with what's called a fund fundatrix, or stem mother. This hatches from an egg that overwintered, and they are usually a darker color, shorter legs, shorter antennae than subsequent generations. So this is potato aphid. Um, all these are potato aphid, macrocyphum euphorbi. In the summer, then, you'll have um, wingless females and winged females produced, um, depending on the species, uh, at various rates. Some species hardly ever produce winged females, and other species produce them very often. Then in the fall, there'll be a specialized female that can lay eggs and mate, and that's what this one looks like in potato aphid. And then males, whoop, males uh, are often winged. And in the case of the aphids that feed on blueberry, they are winged. Um, and uh, the egg-laying females are always wingless. So aphids uh, can be pests of crops in a few different ways. One is that they're sucking the phloem sap, and this can cause direct damage to, to plants, weakening them. Another major way that aphids are pests of crops is by transmitting plant pathogenic viruses. Um, and they're called the vector of the virus in that case. And that's what this project was all about, is the um, a scorch virus in blueberry. And then aphid honeydew, and when they're abundant, can cause da damage to fruits or other plant parts. Um, and then there's obviously, if you're looking at like, you know, your broccoli in your backyard, they can just be directly in the plant or in the harvested crop, which people don't like. Um, so getting to the aphids on Washington blueberries, this was part of a um, project funded by the Blueberry Commission, as well as the Commission on Pesticide Registration. Over the last couple of years, uh, the main aim of it, it revolves around scorch virus, at least with respect to the aphid part of it. And um, Chris Benedict's people, and I, I apologize, I don't know all of who was involved to acknowledge them, but they put out traps and collected aphids from um, blueberry fields and from next to blueberry fields. There were traps in the, the adjacent vegetation, traps in the blueberry field, and then they did some vacuum samples. Um, catching the aphids directly off of the blueberry plants. So the idea behind yellow pan traps is that aphids, uh, as they're flying, are attracted to yellow, especially when it's in contrast to another color, and so they land on a yellow pan filled with some kind of fluid and get trapped in the fluid. And so Chris's people had um, traps deployed in neighboring vegetation and in the blueberry fields, and then they used um, a vacuum um, vacuum samples were done using a leaf blower in reverse to suck the aphids off the blueberry plants. So as I looked through these samples, my only role in this project was to look through all the samples of aphids that were collected. And so when I'm looking through the samples, these are the questions I'm thinking of um, that are potentially important to blueberry growers. Uh, one is uh, which species are actually living in the fields that colonize and can reproduce on blueberries. Um, how abundant are they and when during the season? I definitely saw answers to these questions as I looked through all of these samples. Um, Non-colonizing winged aphids, uh, which species are flying around in the areas of the blueberry fields and where might they be coming from in terms of other plants or, or crops? So I'm going to talk first about what species of blueberry, what species of aphids feed on blueberries, and something about what we found in these samples. So this is a list of, of aphids that are um, known to feed on blueberries. Um, some of these are polyphagous species, and, and polyphagous means that they can feed on many, many different kinds of plants. They're very unusual aphids um, that can do that. Almost all aphids, as I said earlier, feed on only one genus or even a species of plant. So a black bean aphid is polyphagous. It can feed on many different things, including beans. Um, cotton or melon aphid can feed on cotton and melon and many other plants. So that's a polyphagous species, a polyphagous species. Foxglove aphid, potato aphid, green peach aphid. These are some of the biggest pest aphids all around the world, and they're all, they're all polyphagous, can feed on many things. And in the case of blueberry, you would find these feeding on blueberries almost exclusively in the spring or they might be feeding on, on fresh growth during the middle of the summer. 
um, in very low numbers. And then in the fall, as the leaves turn yellow, they might be able to feed on blueberry. But otherwise, they probably won't be feeding on blueberry. So I suggest we uh, eliminate those from consideration. I didn't see any of those uh, colonizing blueberry in the 2017 samples. And so this is uh, foxglove aphid, black bean aphid, and green peach aphid, just for your interest. So we're going to cross off all of those. Um, those are not of concern to us in terms of colonizing the fields that we looked at this season. Um, <clears throat> so that leaves these um, five nominal species that feed on, on blueberries and specialize on vaccinium. Um, there's some disagreement amongst the taxonomists and aphid specialists like me about what name to use, whether it's Ericaphis scamelli or Ericaphis fimbriata. For our purposes, it really doesn't matter, so I'm just going to call it Ericaphis. And then the same situation exists with this genus Illinois. The species identification is very difficult or just unreliable with this genus. Um, if Somebody put a gun to my head and made me choose which species name to use for the Illinois in your blueberry fields, I would choose pepperi. But again, it doesn't really matter for the purposes that we're, we're here for today. So I'm just gonna to refer to these as Ericaphis and Illinois. So which species did we see in blueberry fields uh, during our, our sampling? Bear in mind that our sampling is a broad word. I didn't do any of the sampling. I just looked at the vials of aphids. Um, what we found was uh, all the aphids that I counted were almost 12,500. Um, that included the pan traps, but in terms of the vacuum samples, which is what I'm talking about here, there were 9,125 aphids. And there was a good mix of both, both species, Ericaphis and Illinois. And then the nymphs, uh, which are the immature stages of aphids, I don't try to identify those as I'm uh, counting because uh, identification of immature aphids is very difficult. But I think if you were to look at the relative proportions of Eric Aphids in Illinois, um, the NIPS would be similarly divided. <clears throat> so this was really interesting to me. First of all, that we have both species, almost all, all the fields uh, where aphids were collected with a vacuum sample in 2017 had both, both of these aphids in the field, which potentially complicates uh, the ecology of the situation. And there were no things like green peach aphid and other aphids feeding on the blueberries. So <clears throat> this is the five fields. We had SK1, SK3, WH1, as you see, these are the five fields. And this is how the species uh, broke out in those fields. So <clears throat> um, this is the only field where we did not see any um, wingless Illinois, and also had just very low aphid numbers all, all together. I don't know the details there of, of why this field could have so few aphids, but it's the obvious thing that jumps out at you. Um, interestingly, you look at like SK3, almost all the aphids were Eric aphids. WH7, um, nearly, you know, a great percentage of the aphids were Illinois. Um, I don't think this is related to being in Watkin County versus Gadget County or anything like that. Uh, I don't have an idea why you'd have more of one aphid in some fields over the other aphid. So this is what the, the pattern looked like of one of those fields, SK1, in terms of this, what happened during the growing season. Um, there were some gaps in the, in the sampling, so I'm not sure that the curve looks like this all the way through but there was a good peak in early July, and then it looks like another peak in August. And we don't know what happened here. I haven't um, seen samples from this part here, but um, this is pretty typical of aphids on um, woody plants that they'll start in the spring. Eggs would have hatched probably back in April, and then you start picking up aphids and you need enough to count. And then they're gonna reach some kind of a peak and then they're gonna drop off until fall. So this is pretty typical. Um, interestingly, in the field WH7, it looks pretty different. Again, we have a little bit of a gap here that uh, we don't have data, but they reached very high numbers in early August. <laughs> and remember, this is the field that had Illinois. So I don't know if, if this late peak is related to the species of aphid or what. Um, one thing I do want to mention, and I'll mention it again a couple more times, is that 
In terms of aphids feeding on woody plants, it's very unusual to see really high numbers late in the season like this. Um, generally, uh, aphids that feed on woody plants, like blueberries, a woody plant, uh, they'll peak early in the season and then they'll they'll drop off and they'll stay at very low numbers until spring when or until fall when the leaves start to yellow. So um, these really high numbers of aphids in in August are are concerning to me in terms of um, in terms of pest management if these are vectors of of scorch. So I'll get back to some of those points again in a little bit. Um, so these are the, the aphids that we collected on, uh, in the yellow pan traps in the weeds next to the blueberry fields. Um, and these are basically all invasive pest aphids from various places in the world. Um, the first one uh, is called current lettuce aphid. It's from Europe. Um, in your area, it would be feeding probably on chicory, which is a, a weed, and maybe some related weeds in the dandelion kind of family. Um, and there was just one field, I think, that was just, that had lots and lots and lots of this species of aphid flying around it. And pea aphid, uh, feed on peas and many other legumes, it's extremely common, it's also from Europe. Black bean aphid, as the name implies, um, was pretty common and feeds on beans. Um, and it's black, hence the name black bean aphid. It, but in your area, probably a lot of them are coming from either Canada thistle, which it's one of its favorite, favorite hosts, or from um, things in the beet family, because it can also feed on beets. So it might be coming off of some of the seed crops in Western Washington. Um, Mises persicae, green peach aphid, is especially a pest of potato. <clears throat> and it's interesting to see that uh, it's flying um, around both Skagit and Whatcom counties in um, late summer which is pretty typical of green peach aphid coming off a of potato, that's what you'd expect. Um, Hypromyces lactuki feeds on sow thistles, and it's also from Europe. Um, cabbage aphid is from Europe and feeds on cabbages and many other crucifers. And, and you see the pattern here, these aphids are almost all invasive from other places in the world. The only aphids that I think are native are down here, the pemphigus that, feeds on, that feed on cottonwoods. Otherwise, they're all invasive aphids from elsewhere. Um, and that's pretty much what we deal with anytime you're talking about aphids in, in cropping situations. The interesting thing about your situation with blueberries is that the aphids on blueberries are native uh, to North America. So the, one of the key things I wanna to touch on is this, the fact that uh, um, in terms of the aphids actually caught in traps in the blueberry fields, uh, there's a slightly different mix of species, but it's very common to catch blueberry infesting aphids, especially Eric aphids, flying around in blueberry fields. And what's important about this is that, you know, this is the top aphid being caught in traps in blueberry fields, and it's the best vector of scorch virus. Um, green peach aphid was the second most common, but it is not known to be a vector of scorch virus, et cetera, down this list. Um, Illinois is flying around in the fields as well. As far as I know, as far as I can find, the species of Illinois has not been tested for its ability to vector scorch virus. But sometimes when we're talking about aphids that um, can transmit viruses and do so in the non-persistent way that scorch is transmitted, uh, we think that maybe the aphids flying around in the fields that don't feed on that crop could be transmitting the virus. But very often the colonizing aphid, um, in this case, Eric aphids, is the best vector. So if you have lots of that species flying around, it's most likely to be the colonizing aphid that is spreading the virus. And so this is just all supposition on my part. I'm, I'm guessing, I don't know for sure that Eric aphis is the most important vir uh, aphid in terms of scorch virus, but given how common it is in the fields that were sampled this year, that's, that would be my guess. So um, relevance to the scorch virus, um, 
Eric aphids is known to be uh, the most effective vector of scorch virus. There haven't been very many aphids tested in the lab for their ability to transmit. And as far as I could find, Illinois has not been tested, so we don't know whether it's a vector. But given that it has a close relationship with, with vacciniums um, and blueberry, a uh, very good chance that it, it can also vector scorch virus. And um, <clears throat> these aphids were, were so common in the blueberry fields that I would guess that your Eric aphids in Illinois are most likely the most problematic in terms of spreading scorch virus. Um, so, and then I say also, although non-colonizing aphids can be important in transmission of non-persistent viruses, um, the abundance of Eric aphids and blueberry, in Illinois, Eric aphids in Illinois and blueberry fields, I think um, they're, they're most likely important for blueberries for scorch virus spread, and that's what I just said a minute ago. Um, so there are lots of aphids flying through the um, um, blueberry fields and the areas that blueberries are grown. I think I counted well over 90 different species, um, and I didn't go to a whole lot of lengths to identify to species every single specimen um, of rare species. But I, you know, as I said, I suspect there's at least 200 species of aphids in your region, and if you just trapped in a blueberry field long enough, enough seasons, you'd catch all of them eventually. So. <clears throat> There are a lot of species flying around. Um, probably the uh, colonizing species are the ones that to be to be worried about. So the other point I wanted to make is that um, I've already mentioned that the colonizing species of aphids are <coughs> specific to blueberries. Um, they're unexpectedly abundant in the midsummer. If I was to go out into the <coughs> forest nearby these blueberry fields and look on native vacciniums. <clears throat> aphids would be practically impossible to find in August, but in your cultivated blueberry fields, there's uh, a lot of aphids in July and August. And so I worry that um, spotted wing drosophila control using pyrethroids might um, make aphids more of a problem in blueberries. And this is a common situation in other crops that pyrethroid insecticides, although they can kill aphids um, fairly well, they only kill a percentage of the aphids, and they are very successful at killing the aphid predators and parasites, and that allows the aphids to produce very high populations. So it's just a thought as I look at your samples and I think about your situation, and I know a fair bit about the spotted wing drosophila uh, control problem, um, I worry that use of pyrethroids in blueberries is, is part of the reason we saw so many aphids in the blueberry fields this year. Um, and I just want to emphasize that, again, you know, if the blueberry aphids are host-specific to blueberries. They're not coming from anywhere else, um, except potentially from the nearby forest um, early in the season. But they're generally going to be reproducing throughout the year in blueberries, including the overwintering egg stage. Um, and so, ultimately, to control scorch virus, assuming it's going to be a problem in your area, which I don't know anything about. I want to hasten to add, I'm not a scorch virus expert, but if it becomes a major problem and aphid spreading it, aphid vectoring is the main way that it's spread, um, or even an important way that it's spread, I think the colonizing aphids are most important. That's Eric aphids in Illinois, and you may have to develop an integrated pest management strategy that controls both spotted wing Drosophila and aphids, and that's not an easy thing to do. Um, both are very difficult uh, insects to control. So I'm gonna wrap up and see if there's any questions, and I've lost track of how much time I've used, um, but I wanna acknowledge the funding from the Blueberry Commission and the Commission on Pesticide Registration, and thank uh, Betsy for cleaning up the samples. This is just a, a subset of all the samples um, that she cleaned up for me. Um, into, into really nice uh, vials of aphids. That, so all I had to look at was aphids, and that's a real help. Um, and then there's lots of anonymous people that gathered all the samples who I don't know and have never met. Um, but thanks to them, too, it's, a, it's a, a lot of work putting together all the samples I've looked at, especially for the 2017 season. And uh, there's uh, one of my collecting sites from Central Arizona a couple of years ago, and um, I'd be happy to take questions if you have any?